Hello YouTube, this is Sam Gerrans from Quarterlight.com. Today is Thursday the 30th of December 2021 and I'm going to go through another one of the surahs, the expositions thereof, um, but first a bit of housekeeping. If I look a bit bleary-eyed it's because I've been working and uh, a lot over the last eight or ten days. What I've been doing is writing up the insights that accrued from the last two periods of fasting um, regarding the the perennial question of the mysterious letters. In brief, I've understood what they are and how they work, but I didn't understand what they're for. I mean, beyond providing a kind of proof and interlocking system for the Quran um, and some part of an indexing system. Um, but now I've got the rest of it and I've written up. I mean, it's one thing, you know, having insights. It's another thing kind of being able to explain them. But I have been able to, and the, the result is a um, a new article, which is, well, it's it's 19,000 uh, words long, which, just to put it into perspective, is about the length of a, a master's dissertation. So that's what I've been doing over the last 10 days, and so that's why I look the way that I do. I've sent it on to a few people that uh, I would uh, appreciate uh, their feedback, Um you know, people from different areas of life. I've sent it off to about f four or five people. And I'm going to wait and get their notes. And then after that, I'm just going to publish it on... I'll, I'll read the introduction uh, as part of a video just to kind of explain what it's about. And then I'll publish it on the site and then that'll be it. So that's that. Now, to move forward, um, we're going to look today at Surah 86. And if you've been following this series of of videos, then you'll know that what I'm really doing is providing expositions. An exposition is, I suppose it's a bit of a jam really, isn't it? It's riffing off the, the topic, but trying to kind of present it in, in a way that is relevant um, uh, in the broader scheme of things. So this isn't like, you know, uh, a definitive, um, you know, ex kind of explanation of all the, the the background and so on um i mean that kind of work i think you know there, there are different types of of that sort of work some of which are still valid some of which aren't it's it's what i'm trying to do here is to ex just kind of present this in a way that shows that the quran is relevant and it is to our time and in a way the uh, our good friends in the new world order have sort of played into my hands in the last couple of years by by making uh, their intentions so obvious that really you have to kind of be in active denial, not you know, not to see it anymore, and it have have made things a lot easier. So a lot of my expositions over these uh, series of of surahs between fifty and the end of the, the Quran are in some ways, you know, tailored to that reality. Anyway, we'll just jump in and see how we go. So it's Surah 86. By the sky and the night comer, and what will convey to thee what the night comer is? The piercing star. Now, as I will have said many times over the course of this series of, of talks, this section between 50 and the end of the Quran contains many oaths. And oaths are not just, you know, oh, look at that. Isn't it amazing? And now we're going to talk about something else. Oaths are always relevant to the context. That's the, the first thing. But what they're doing is they're drawing the attention to something which is so that you can infer from that something which is to come but isn't yet. Now, just looking at this, if you've seen my previous videos, um, it, it appeals firstly to the sky. Now, the last, if we just turn back a few, Surah 85, by the sky full of constellations and by the promised day. And if we move over here to Surah 84, when the sky is split asunder and hearkens to its Lord as it must. Um, you know, this is, this is a theme, Surah 82, down here. When the sky splits open, and when the stars are scattered. So this is a, by virtue of the content, it's something of a grouping um, around these, so you can understand that them in that way. 
by the sky and the night comer, and what will convey to thee what the night comer is. وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ مَا الطَّارِقَ and this this kind of convention and what will convey to thee, you'll find this many times, well, many times, I don't know, six or eight, ten times, something like that throughout the Qur'an. This is a signpost. This is saying, you, you don't know what this is. I'm now going to tell you. So that that's what that means. And the Qur'an has many conventions. Um, if you look at my broader work, uh, the tools, the toolkit that I've developed and used, which informs... All of my work, actually, but particularly uh, pantextual analysis, whereby, unlike the traditionalist who just, you know, sticks, <laughs> gets his definitions. Well, actually, actually, he, he imports them on on a on an ad hoc basis from an extraneous literature um, to a book which claims to be from God, preserved and complete. Which seems to me, a, you know, a really like you're kind of digging away the foundation from underneath you. Anyway, uh, the point of this talk isn't to, to, to denigrate his um, methodologies particularly, but what pantextual analysis does is goes to the Quran and looks at all of the instances of a particular word and then, and then on the basis of a book which says it's from God, complete and consistent, then then seeks values on that basis where around which all of those instances can align and that that's one of the techniques that i use another is this it's what i would call quranic definitions now not all quranic definitions are of this type but this one is where it actually tells you and what will convey to what will convey to thee what the night comer is it's saying what so what's going to tell you what this is and it, it, there are several of these quite close to this surah and then it comes it says the piercing star so that's what at-tariq is it's it's telling you right here bang okay it, the quran is is a dictionary uh, uh, amongst you know among other things it's telling you what what this thing is so there are other types of quranic definitions for example um it will talk about you know the such and such a type of a type of people and then it'll, then it'll describe them well that's the definition you see if you you'll often find that that definition comports you know, either entirely or very closely or to some extent with uh, what the traditionalist says it means. It's, it's, not, it's not often there's much tension there, but sometimes there is a, a nuance that's been lost um, over 1,400 years, perhaps not surprisingly, and the Quran retains it so you can get back to the original sense. If you compare that with languages like English, for example, I, as an educated English speaker, if I were to read even, uh, well, Shakespeare, say 400 years ago, uh, I, I need some assistance. <laughs> and firstly, and the second, secondly, you'll find words which are what are called false friends. These are words which have changed their meaning, sometimes completely to, to uh, 180 degrees, to something new. And that's just what happens to languages. Uh, what the example I use in my work is the word gay. Now, my father's generation, the word gay, it meant it meant what gay means. It means uh, carefree, happy, and generally of a blithe and um, upbeat disposition. That's what gay actually meant. That's, that's the, the dictionary definition of that word. Um, and that word has been changed in one generation to mean sodomite. I mean, can you imagine? So... Th the fact that this happens to languages is not is not surprising, and especially to when we when we know that every every messenger, every prophet had people coming after them, inserting into the, you know into what they got, trying to insinuate their own stuff. So there's actually a you know an, a, a, a kind of overt agenda working against it. So that's always going to be the case. But the Quran contains within it these mechanisms, added to which is the fact that the Arabic language. As a language, um, I, I certainly don't hold to the idea that Arabic is a holy and amazing language, you know, is in and of itself. Clearly, Arabic was the language of the of the populace. And if you know anything about historically how religions have worked, normally they use another language. There'll be the language of the priesthood. And actually this has gone full circle with arabic i mean it's it the quran says it's in arabic that, that you may, might use reasons so that you might understand it was in the language of the of the of the, the popular language 
and now that's kind of gone full circle where Arabic now is the holy language. Well, that was never that was never the intention. But to get back to Arabic as a language, as a Semitic language, um, it has the it has s several deficiencies. It's deficient in um, intense, but it's extremely rich in in terms of root. And what I mean by that is you can get back to what words mean. So, to give you an example, um, if you think of the word to kind of create an English equivalent, if you have the word hospital, if you ha sp if we're going to say that that's the root, then you've got hospitality, hospice, hosp hospitable, those sorts of words, which are clearly associated with this common root. Arabic does the same, but it does it in a much, in more of a 3D kind of way, because there are different ways that verbs develop according to what are called forms. And, but what that means is, you can dig into the language. So let's say, for example, uh, there's the word you know, hospice, to take our example, and hospital and hospitable and all these other types of words, quite clearly related to this common root. And, and, then, and then you hear a verb, let's say, let's just make one up, hospitate. And they're telling you that that means you've got to give X amount of your income to, to the priesthood. Well, You've, you've got a kind of a uh -uh moment there because quite clearly that does not comport with what, what all these other words mean. Well, these these are some of the things which um, the, the Quran and, and the Arabic language guard against. Uh, and these are things which are practiced upon the uh, credulous and somewhat undiscerning uh, layperson. But that the Quran means you could, because of the, the way that Arabic works, not that I think it's a holy language, but it, this is a feature of it. And the way that the Quran is constructed, you can get back to, you can identify, See, you see what they're doing? There it means this, there it means this, there it means this, but here, <clears throat> and you can demonstrate it. Anyway, these are a, a toolkit that I've developed and I've used in all of my work. And it's not like I'm trying to keep them to myself. I'm trying to say this, this is what you can use too. Um, you, you do have to <clears throat> exercise judgment with them. You do, you know, there's no, there's no replacement. There's no substitute for hard work. A lot of it's work. I, I get just on a quicker side, I get people with their enthusiasms write to me because they've, they've understood this. And then they go flying off and just <clears throat> on a very ad hoc basis, think applying it in in not a very mature way. What I'm trying to say is that you you, you it requires work. There's no substitute just for for the legwork. There's no getting away from that. And um, you find something quite similar in Christianity. Like Christians, what they'll do is they'll go to what's it called? Uh, there's this. Strong's concordance and find some abstract meaning for based around a Hebrew root and then say, oh, well, it all means that. Well, maybe it does, but, you know, you've got more work to do. It is work, but, you know, you, you if you have a good tools and you work hard and diligently, you can expect some good results. The, the problem, in my view, is with, with the traditionalist. Not going to be horrible about him. I've got some I've got some quite good things to say about traditionalist. Um, I'm not going to say them here, but but I do have some. Is that his toolkit is faulty, and it always has been. <laughs> you can't really go to another source for the mechanisms by which to understand a book that says that it's from God, complete and perfect. You, you can't. It just it's just philosophically in an irreconcilable position. Um, no matter you know how much name calling and shaming language you use, that's 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 just the case. So anyway, let's get back to the to the main subject. There is no soul but has over it a custodian. We've met this type of uh, motif before in a series of talks. Everything that we do, we have a right. We have a right to record on the left and on the right of us. Every word that we use, all of our thoughts, our actions. God is closer to us than the than the jugular vein. Nothing is hidden. Um, we may wish it to be or feel that it is, but 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 it isn't. And the the ultimate reality to which all of us are going, including 
our, our good friends, the, the the New World Order and ruling elite, is is the judgment. It's that's that's the 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 porch, as it were, to eternity. And at the moment, we're just in the antechamber, and all of this stuff that seems very important, and and it is it is important in a certain way, but there it's going to kind of fade into insignificance and and our life which seems so um in which we are all so wrapped up you know right now will just seem as though we were just we were here for just for a morning just for a few hours but the record um everything is in a preserved writ our entire life is in a preserved writ which takes me back as well to the piercing star. Well, let's just move back to that. Um, and what will convey to thee what the night comer is, the piercing star. Now, rather than um, kind of develop thoughts on which particular star we're talking about here, quite clearly there, there is the, the, the brightest star in the sky, which would be serious. Um, the sky rotates on a, you know, on a, on a almost twenty four hour basis, and that rotation of something that you can see coming through the sky and that it's going to come back, this is really the, it's the ability, the human ability to extrapolate, to understand on the basis of what it's already seen that something that it hasn't seen yet is going to happen. This is a a very common motif, and as I've mentioned before, this is the only thing that that human beings really can do. I mean, animals can do it. They can do it on an instinctive level, but we, we can do it intellectually. We can decide, aha, uh -huh, I see, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. It's called, it's called agency, the ability to have agency, the ability to I understand that something that hasn't happened yet is going to happen, extrapolate on the basis of, of existing data something which is, you know, which, which is, can be inferred, and then to take preemptive action on that basis. That's what sets us apart from, from, animals who work on it and they work on a purely instinctive basis now what religion will do is convince you to outsource that responsibility and this is the key thing the one thing that sets us apart to them now if if in the case of of the islamic religion <laughs> they could point to some sort of you know success in the last I don't know, 800 years or so, that would be different, wouldn't it? I mean, if we, if we were talking about the high culture, and it was certainly a high culture based around Baghdad or Cordoba or, or whatever, that would be one thing. But we're not. We're talking about people who are um, really conspicuous by their um, consistent lack of achievement. And at, from what I see, at least, at, at any opportunity, they can't wait to leave the countries that they've made so horrible and go and live in the West that they criticise and then mess up when they get there. So I, I don't see it. I mean, they, they don't strike me as, you know, as convincing um, in, any, in any way whatsoever. And also, let's be honest about it. Would you trust them to change the oil in your car? I'm talking about the, you know, the priesthood here. I certainly wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't buy a second-hand car from any of them. Um, and yet, and yet, I, I get attacked all the time. You know, the scholars—they know this, they know that, and they know the other. May, maybe, but let's look at the results. And I, I'm not convinced by the result. And I, I certainly don't. I don't feel like outsourcing responsibility for my eternal soul to people that I wouldn't buy a second-hand car from. I don't know. You, you have got to decide that one for yourself. But that's me. So I'm not here telling you what you should believe. I'm telling you what I'm really doing in this channel is showcasing my process of due diligence in order to arrive at what I believe. That's that's what I'm doing. So, and and sharing tools because. There, are, there is a way to approach this book, and um, it, it, it isn't rocket science, but there are some principles that you have to learn, but the, the book itself will teach you those principles. That, that's been my experience, and I've been doing this now full-time for, well, if we, disc, if we don't include all of the background reading and, and all of that, but full-time just reading this book, working with this book. Uh, eight years so that's what I've discovered and I'm you know I, I can't wait to um, I'm only too happy to kind of share that with other people I'm not, I'm not creating like some sort of fiefdom here I'm not interested in that I, I'm, I'm trying to teach 
people to fish rather than rather than giving them a fish and telling them here's a fishing rod, they say use it. That, that's 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 the principle. So let's continue. Ah, now let's not continue. I had another thought to do with the piercing star, and it says, and there is no soul but has over it a custodian. I'm not stating this as some strong point of doctrine, but it's an interesting thought that when if you listen to people's near-death experience, they with unerring regularity cite the the experience that they had um, of seeing a bright light. I'm not saying that this is the definitive meaning of this verse, and if you don't believe it, you know, you're <laughs> damned to hell or anything like that. I'm saying that this is a thought that's come into my mind. Now, I would also argue that uh, the whole near-death thing, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that I trust it. Um, I'm sure it seems very real to people who have it. I don't doubt that. Um, but then dreams can seem very real to people who have them. And I do tend to feel that when you're dead, you're dead. You don't come back. Because if, 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 you, if you were able to come back, you weren't really dead. That, that would be my position also. But I thought I would include that. Let's continue. So let man look from what he was created. He was created from a gushing water issuing forth from between the loins and the breastbones. So we started here by the sky and the night comer, you know, the most exalted, the highest vault of heaven. And now, you know, it's, it's very, if you, if you we, we're at a great advantage in some ways in our time. I mean, I know people haven't got the attention span of a goldfish anymore because of the, the time that we're living in. Um, whereas our forefathers were able to just memorize you know, tons of stuff because that's what they used. But in one way, we do have an advantage, and to my mind, and that advantage is that we're able, we've seen so many films, we're able to think in, a, in, in, in cinematic ways. And if you think about cinema, you know, you have the, you have the landscape shot and then, you know, you kind of hone in to to the man at the top of the hill and you can see the close-up of his face and stuff. This is a language. If you were to show that to somebody who wasn't schooled in it, they wouldn't. They probably wouldn't be able to join the pieces together. Our minds are able to join those pieces together because we've seen it over and over and over and over again. We were born in it. We just saw it. In the same way as we would understand, for example, um, road signs as we're driving, driving around we're absorbing road signs well maybe not where i live in russia but in other countries people are actually sort of taking them in and making judgments on the basis of it of, of that information it's, it's it's a language a symbolic language whereas cinema is it is it's its form is a is a form of language the quran works in in, in some ways you can feel the fade to black scene two that scene cuts you know it, it's a it's a it's an edited process that your mind once you kind of become a, a, a cl accustomed to it is able to follow those cuts people say well the quran is very disjointed it's disjointed in the way you know, a movie is disjointed but the story is there but it's true that the boring bits have all been edited out and <clears throat> excuse me the mind if you become attuned to it you can you can follow the cuts and the the, the sort of fades and, and and what have you and understand that this is a new scene it's it's just a way of you just need to habituate yourself to that type of language <coughs> to continue ah yeah what did i mention that because because we've gone from the you know the the vast straight down to the the prosaic the banal the practical and and the the physical the you know the sort of functional of of, of the procreative sense um, process for human beings to continue. He is able to return him, so that's the point. God who created the heavens and the earth, the piercing star, you, me, he is able to return him, and this is the uh, and again. And by the sky and the night come up, something that comes around every night. He is able to return him. This is the motif, you see. We're all returning back to God. The day the secrets are tried. And remember, if we go back, there is no soul but has over it a custodian. 
the day the secrets are tried. Then will he have neither power nor helper by the sky full of returning. See these folding into itself these these motifs. It, it's not linear. It's not left brain. It can be understood if you look at my work. You know, <laughs> there's more analysis than you possibly hoped to to look at. But the Quran, as it's as it, as a thing. It's an interplay between that sort of left hemisphere and right hemisphere, <clears throat> the analytical linear and the sort of the amorphous and creative and, if you want to use the word I don't particularly, particularly like it, mystical essence, but they're, they're together. And by the earth full of cracks, if you think about it, if the earth didn't have cracks, wouldn't be able to grow anything. It's, it's precisely the cracks that provi provide the, the space it, through which um, things can grow. And without that, we'd all, none of us would be alive because there would be no food. It is a decisive word, and it is not in jest. They plan a plan, and I plan a plan. So grant thou respite to the false claimers of guidance. Grant, grant thou them respite a while. This is to put everything in the perspective of eternity. And <clears throat> at this time when, I mean, actually, we were always living, living under the, the t within a, a planned economy and um, under a, you know, a, 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 a effectively a, a de facto world government, as I say, for the last hundred years, at least most places in the world. <clears throat> now it's obvious. Now they've, the, the the satin glove is off the iron fist, as it were, um, and it can seem, and it does. There's no question about it. it. Can seem very big, but it's not as big as death. And at, there are worse things than it. For example, like going to hell forever. And if you look at the media, I I, I try to keep away from it as much as possible. But obviously, I have some engagement with it. It's trying to terrify you into oh this or all that as if as as though death were the worst thing that could possibly happen. And for a materialist, it is. Yeah, no more shopping. But to traditional man, a man whose you know, essential connections are to land, through blood, through through religion, these things are of no real consequence. It's only it's only kind of neutered, sanitized man who is defined by government papers and, um, and and those sorts of ideas. For him, you know, he's a materialist. That, that's what's important to him. But what this does, what this surah and many, 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 most, I would say, of the surahs in this, what I call the Quran set between 15 and 114, most of them um, have this or some 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 form of this type of motif placing all these things into a context into the the broader context of eternity and at this time you know nothing is going back to the, you know the covid thing nothing has changed you were always going to die at some point um you were always going towards eternity you were always living in a materialist society uh, you know in, in this time certainly that's the case um, I mean, if you take so-called communism and so-called capitalism, they're identical, pretty much. They're utterly materialistic religions. And where we are now, what's happening now is that they've been conflated um, according to a plan. And what the, the new religion is, is basically government religion, belief in government. And this is a very interesting kind of... Um, mechanism because where i live if you have any dealings with the government the government's only a problem i mean the, the best case scenario uh, in any sort of kind of tyrannical situation is for the government to leave you alone i don't want anything for the government i don't i just leave me alone but of course they won't leave you alone socialists materialists will never leave you alone they've always got to control you because they've only got this life <laughs> what else have they got and just a brief thought to wrap this up. Um, 
having had a few dealings with the government recently, uh, it's nothing very serious, just actually receiving books. You know, it's just, they just create, mainly they're stupid. Right? The government is like a very big, very stupid post office. Um, it's got its rules and it's not like they're mainly that they're applying any sort of intelligence to the situation. What they're doing is just follow, like pilots, they're just following ch checklists. And if, if you get caught up in their system, it can just become extremely time consuming and, and all the rest of it. But what I was thinking about was isn't interesting with government is that the government is, it, what it is, is really they're prison warders. Okay, you're living in a prison. You always were. I am here. You are there. And that, now you can see it or people you know, in the West can see it. Uh, the difference is, from a prison, is that the prison warders in a prison can go home. But the prison warders in this prison, they live in the same prison. It's, it's, it's an amazing um, sort of self-referencing -re structure, isn't it? And if you kind of get to the, the, the nub of it, which is government, it's, it's an idea. It's, it isn't anything real. If you're trying to explain it to somebody, you just just woke and just never been alive before he said what is it what what is this government is it the laws is it the people no, it's an idea it's a it's a it's a demonic spirit as far as i can see and all the governments that we have they're all materialist doesn't matter where you live they're all talking about economics um, you know standard of living gdp all these kind of very materialistic um measures and fundamentally, they're all anti-God. So there you are. It, it could only go here. W what you're in is a system which is now requiring you to to submit and to wear your badges of submission. Submission, if you've noticed, with all the lead-up, uh, the sodomite agenda, and all the rest of all the other things that that they've rolled out over the last hundred years, it wasn't that they just applied them to you and you had sort of a grin and bear it. They require you to. They want you to clap for it. They want you to be happy that they're doing whatever it is they're doing to you. Well, now we're in the next one because the war has changed. It used to be wars against actual countries, and now, and then it went to the war, the kind of third generation wars against, you know, I call it tourism, which has just disappeared, disappeared for a while, hasn't it? And now it's it's developed even further, and now the enemies is what it always was, but now it's being declared, and it's you. You see. But that's why these verses, these sorters are so powerful is because it places all of that existential crisis and tension into a context in which you and I and everyone else, all of them, all of the prison warders are accountable on a day of eternity. And that puts things in perspective. And that's that's all for now. If you're listening on YouTube, you can download my full translation of the Quran and all other work free using the button in the top right-hand corner, or buy the hard copy there at 10% less than on Amazon. You can download the audio from my YouTube videos to your mobile device using the links in the drop-down below. I recommend meetquranites.com to connect with other Quran alone believers. Like if you like, comment if you have something constructive to say, and subscribe to get more each week. And use the link in the drop-down below to donate if you would like to help me keep doing this. And remember, this life is short, eternity is long. If you want good trees, plant good seeds.